Rod Cavanaugh, Executive Director of the Literary Freedom Project. The Literary Freedom Project is a nonprofit based here in the Bronx. Um, as implied in its title, we focus on literary programs here in the Bronx. We are host, one of the hosts for tonight. Um, we also host the book club, One Book, One Bronx. We host an annual conference in the Bronx called the Mosaic Literary Conference. Um, that kind of came out of the Mosaic Literary Magazine, um, which was published for about 20 years. Yeah. Both, both Tara and Tayemba um, wrote for the magazine. Deeply appreciate that. Um, but tonight, One Book, One Bronx, uh, in collaboration with the Leonard Leaf Library at Lehman College, uh, part of the CUNY system, will host, uh, we're hosting a series of eclectic programs and reading groups um, as part of a nationwide initiative, Lift Every Voice, Why African-American Poetry Matters. Lift Every Voice is a year-long national public humanities initiative sponsored by the Library of America and the Schomburg Center for Research into Black Culture that seeks to engage participants in a multifaceted exploration of African-American poetry the perspectives it offers on American history and the ongoing struggle for racial justice and the universality of its imaginative response to the personal experiences of Black Americans over three centuries. Um, and out of that sort of initiative uh, came a book, um, African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song, um, it is, as they, they state, the biggest, most ambitious anthology of Black poetry ever published, gathering over 250 poets from the colonial period to the present. Uh, it was edited by Kevin Young, and it is rumored to be over 1,000 pages. So if you get that book of poetry, you won't have to buy another book of poetry for at least a month. So, um, definitely, should, definitely. after that month that is, is over, go out and start buying poetry books again. Right. Um, so, I just want to thank um, all of our guests. Um, Tayemba Jess, he is the, the man of, of the hour. Uh, Tayemba is a, I'm not going to read everyone's bios, but Tayemba is a Pulitzer Prize winning um, poet and author of the book Olio. Um, Tara Betts, who will be in conversation with uh, Tayemba, uh, is also uh, a well regarded poet, um, an, an author, and writer. She does a bunch of stuff. And Paula Ramirez, I don't know what Paula's doing right now, but <laughs> Paula is our uh, book club facilitator. She's also a poet. Um, and she's an educator um, here in the Bronx. Um, one of our partners um, from the Leonard Leaf Library is uh, Robert Farrell. Um, I want to introduce Robert, who's been a, a great partner in this program. Uh, I believe he'll have a few words to say. Uh, yes, uh, first I'd like to introduce uh, Lehman's president, uh, Daniel Lemons, uh, to welcome you all to, to this event. Uh, which is not at Lehman College, although we really wish it were. Um, and we really wish we had copies of Olio that we were handing out as we often do at these sorts of events um, when we host them at Lehman College. So I just want to um, turn it over to, Professor, uh, to Dr. Lemons uh, to uh, welcome everyone. Thank you, Robert. Um, so welcome virtually to everyone to this great event. I feel like I'm in this amazing company and you know, of course, Robert, you're a poet too. So I think I'm just surrounded by poets here this evening. It's just terrific. Uh, it's an honor to have uh, Professor Tayemba Jess with us. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the whole series of events is really a pretty great series, I can see. And so we're, we're honored to have you. And CUNY is very fortunate to have Mr. Jess as well as a professor at the College of uh, Staten Island. So uh, we're a little envious, but you know, at least you're in CUNY. Um, you know, as, a, as an award 
winning poet, uh, many awards actually, uh, including the 2017 Pulitzer Prize. Um, you know, it really is, it's, it's terrific to have you with us this evening. Thanks to the Leonard Leaf Library and again, uh, Professor Farrell for his work, uh, One Book, One Bronx, the Liberty Freedom Project, and I'm sure quite a few others who've been involved in pulling this together, not only this evening, but the series. So um, thanks to all of you. Uh, uh, Mr. Jess, look forward to the evening and um, end of the discussion that's gonna follow, which uh, I'm sure is gonna be great. So thank you very much. Thank you, it's an honor. Thank you also. Yeah, and um, you know, again, thank you, uh, President Lemons, and thanks uh, for the college's support for tonight's events. Uh, in addition to thanking Professor Jess and Dr. Betts uh, for being with us tonight to celebrate the publication of African American Poetry, 250 Years of Song, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge some of our partners. Uh, first, the CUNY Center for Humanities and the Lost and Found Project. Um, they've been a major source of support, uh, specifically Samson uh, Starkweather, uh, Kendra Sullivan, and Stefan Lawrence. Uh, tomorrow's event in the series featuring Harmony Holiday and Hanif uh, Abdurraqib. Uh, is being hosted by the Center for Humanities, and we encourage you all to attend. Uh, second, thank you to the Audre Lorde Great Read at Lehman College, who allowed us to help get the word out about their event on Thursday, which is organized by Professor Sarah Omer of Lehman College and is uh, going to be absolutely amazing. Uh, shout out to all the Lehman faculty working on that series, which will be happening throughout the semester, and we'll be putting links in the chat for some of these things um, throughout the evening. Um, we also want to acknowledge the indefatigable work of Mary Sutton at the Library of America, who has supported us from start to finish and whose recorded remarks we'll hear shortly, as Ron mentioned. And a thank you to uh, the Office of Media Relations and the Leonard Leaf Library at Lehman and to our Chief Librarian, Kenneth Schlesinger, who spotted the Library of America's call for proposals, um, which kind of has brought us here tonight. Last, if you don't know Ron Cavanaugh and the work he does in the Bronx, uh, now you do. He has been a great partner on this and other ventures. Uh, please check out, follow, and support, and I emphasize support, uh, show some love. And we know that the color of love is green and we don't mean <laughs> envy. We're talking about some money. Um, support One Book, One Bronx, and the Literary Freedom Project if you can find it in your heart to do so because the work that he does here in the Bronx, um, running these book clubs, particularly during this pandemic, um, you know, we have Paula Ramirez who's, who's working with that too here with us tonight. It has been um, something very special uh, for the Bronx and we just want to acknowledge that. So thank you, Ron. Thank you. Um, so up next, we're going to feature a um, short intro from Mary Sutton, um, who's with the um, uh, National Endowment for Humanities uh, Library of America. Good evening. My name is Mary Sutton and I'm National Endowment for the Humanities, Scholar in Public Humanities and Project Manager for Lift Every Voice, a nationwide celebration of the African American poetic tradition directed by Library of America in partnership with the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. The project has been funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, Mellon Foundation and Emerson Collective. The initiative features five signature events in five major cities, New York, Atlanta, Chicago, Los Angeles, and Kansas City. It also includes smaller public programs such as this one and 49 sites around the country. Lift Every Voice not only provides communities with opportunities to learn about the Black poetic tradition, but to engage with it through readings, musical performances, seminars, and conversations. It illustrates the ways in which poetry is all around and how it enriches our daily lives. Tonight's conversation with Pulitzer Prize winning poet Tahim Bajess, author of Olio and Lead Belly, reiterates the integrality of African American life, culture, history, artistry, and activism in every facet 
of American history and culture. We hope that you enjoy tonight's program and thank you for being a part of Lift Every Voice. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Sutton. And with that, um, we are going to introduce uh, Kayan with Jess. Um, I'll just kind of, well, Ms. Sutton did give you a quick overview, but um, Pulitzer Prize winning poet Kayan with Jess is the author of two books of poetry, Lead Belly and Olio. Olio won the 2017 Pulitzer Prize, the Ansfield Wolf Book Award, the Midland Society Authors Award in Poetry, and received an outstanding contribution to publishing citation from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. It was also nominated for a National Book, excuse me, National Book Critic Circle Award, the Penn Jean Stein Book Award, and the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. Let Belly was the winner of the 2004 National Poetry Series. Um, the Library Journal and Black Issues Book Review book review, both named that book, Best Poetry Books of 2005. Uh, so with that all done, we are going to welcome um, Mr. Tayemba Jess to read from Olio. Well, um, uh, so many people to thank you. Uh, thank you for to Lehman College, to uh, to Ron Kavanaugh, who's been out, out here been a, being a soldier with Mosaic and all this the Mosaic Enterprises. Um, uh, thanks to CUNY for uh, bringing me out here <laughs> to the East Coast to, to teach. <laughs> uh, and uh, thanks to the NEH for sponsoring this. So many people to thank for, uh, for bringing me to the boogie down Bronx to, <laughs> to, the, to, uh, to read some poems with y'all. So. Uh, I will, uh, I think I'll just kind of get into it, shall I? Should, does that sound like, well, what I will start with is the, is the book and the, uh, and the cover of the book. I think you can see that. I don't think it's reversed in your, in your, uh, lens, et cetera, but Olio spelling O-L-I-O -O, and then O-L-I-O -O, and then O-L-I-O -O, and then O-L-I-O, -O, et cetera, in multiple directions and also trying to, Get the idea of a of a of a face caught perhaps in mid song or uh, in mid speech, so to speak. But uh, uh, get getting just very um, very stark image of, of a face there in my mind. But anyway, that's that's the uh, that's the essence of the book. It, it is about the Olio, which is the middle part of the minstrel show, which is uh, a device started by white folks at the uh, in the first 30 years of the 19th century to make fun of black folks and to uh, reinforce uh, white supremacy. And it's form of, it was America's first form of theater, of original theater, so to speak. And then later off in the latter part of the 19th century, uh, it was the oleo part of the show, which was the middle part where there would be a, a hodgepodge of performances from juggling to perhaps uh, singing to comedy, et cetera. The Olio part kind of uh, survived and became what we know as vaudeville, okay? And then that evolved into what we call the great white way, Broadway, right? So uh, what I'm trying to do here is, is capture the lives of African-Americans who were creatives at the end of the, in, end of the Civil War up until the early part of the 20th century. So basically from 1865 to around the end of World War I, looking at the lives of black folks who were really for the first time in their lives and their families' lives were seeking to go out and make a living doing what came to them beautifully and gracefully and through sweat and toil. And that is the, the, uh, the, the discipline over their, their talents in various fields of uh, artistic endeavor. So I'm gonna read uh, just the beginning of this. Uh, this there's, a, there's a long crown of sonnets that's for the Fisk Jubilee singers, right? 
out of uh, Nashville who were the foundation of uh, spirituals as we know them today, Fist Jubilee Proclamation. And this poem is dedicated to several churches, all of which were burned down to the ground uh, throughout America's history. That, that is, this is dedicated to Mother Manuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, 1822, dedicated to Cross Ankle Church in Palmetto, Georgia in 1899, dedicated to Greenleaf Presbyterian Church in Keeling, Tennessee, Red Top Church in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, First Baptist Church in Carteret, New Jersey, Fulton Street Methodist Church in Chicago, Illinois, Second Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan, Macedonia Baptist Church, Egg Harbor City, New Jersey, Mount Methodist Church in Henderson, North Carolina, Negro Methodist Church in Loganville, Georgia, Fish Jubilee Proclamation with the epigraph, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. O oh, sing unto the world with blue song born from newly freed throats, sprung loose from lungs once bound within bonded skin, scored from dawn to dusk with coffle and lash, every tongue unfurled as the body's flag, every breath conjured despite loss we've had. Bear witness to the birthing of our hymn from story depths of America's sin. So worn psalms, blessed in our blood through dark lessons of the past, struggling to be heard. Behold, the bold sound we found in ourselves that was hidden, cast out of the garden of freedom. It's loud and unbeaten, then soft as a newborn's face. Each note bursting loose from human bondage. So that's for the Fish Jubilee Singers, a group of um, more or less, mostly newly freed, uh, uh, formerly enslaved black, black folks who were trying to get their education on and found themselves at Fish Jubilee University uh, uh, and touring around the world to sing their songs and gather monies that actually built the campus of Fisk University. Uh, and if you go there today and have the opportunity to, to see the Fish Jubilee Singers, I urge you to do so. Got to see them singing. It was really like stepping into uh, the mouth of God, listening to them sing this ancestral uh, journey that went back generation after generation. So that's for the Fish Jubilee Singers. There's a bunch of other folks that, that are in this book that some of them are piano players. Some of them are, uh, are one is a sculptor, one is, one is a uh, opera singer. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a guy who's a, an escape artist, so to speak. Uh, all kinds of folks who were uh, experiencing freedom for the first time in, as black folks in America's history who were trying to get by you know, using their God-given talent. So without further ado, I think I'll just, I'll, I'll introduce you to this one guy. Here's a guy named uh, Blind Boone. Blind Boone is an interesting cat. <laughs> he was born 1865, directly after the Civil War. His, uh, his, his mother was a newly freed slave. And, uh, Within about six months after he was born, he caught encephalitis. And the only real cure that they had for encephalitis at that time was, uh, well, encephalitis is your brain is, you have brain fever, your brain is swelling, it's going to kill you unless the relief, unless the swelling is relieved. Didn't have any penicillin, didn't have any antibiotics. Uh, and the only real antidote that the country doctor had to remove the pressure on the brain was to remove the infant's eyes. And hence he became blind boom. Later on, he became a very famous ragtime and uh, uh, he just became a, re a famous ragtime piano player who was known around the world. This is entitled Blind Boone's Blessings. 
bless the fever in that night. In the sixth month of my life, bless the fever for it gave me sight. It swore my brain to fit God's gift. It brought the hand that would lift each eye from my infant skull. Bless the sweat, my baby ball. Bless the horse that hauls a surgeon through dusk's dark, half drunk and swearing into mine. Bless the flame, sterilized the metal of the spoon. Bless the path between lid and bone, slipped and slid by that instrument of my deliverance from sight. Bless the handling of the knife. Bless that night that gave me night, wrapped around my bloody face, whispered how I could be grace notes, arpeggios, a piano roll of sound, copying each note from everything around me. You see, I'm sure at first there was the hurt and the scalding pain. But then again, bless an infant's too short memory. All I know is what lies beyond light. I've learned this is what's right for this one right here. Yes, bless the fever. Then listen close, spare an ear to this piano and shut your eyes close. That's Blind Boone. Fascinating, uh, fascinating character out of Columbus, Missouri. Who uh, you go down, you go down there today. You can go still go to Blind Boone's house, and he had a he has a huge chickering piano. That, uh, uh, to my knowledge, they still have in that, in that, uh, in his original house. Blind Boone, an interesting character. Some other pope folks in the uh, in the itinerary in the OLEO. I think I would, uh, I would, I think, I think I can share a screen here. Correct. Well, we're gonna find out. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm gonna share a screen and share with you uh, the story of these two. Young women, these two women are called. Oops. There you go. I, are you looking at uh, the picture of the McCoy twins? I think that you are. These are the McCoy twins. Christine and Millie McCoy, born in 1849 in North Carolina, born into slavery, uh, born very distinctly, right? They are conjoined twins, pygopagus twins is the condition that they came, uh, uh, came to life with. Uh, they were born, they are not two twins just standing back to back. They are joined through the back, essentially down from the bottom of the rib cage or so through the, uh, through the pelvis. Very, very, very rare to have a pair of surviving Pygopagus twins. And uh, the more I researched them, the more I found out about them. And I found myself drawn to, to just try and tell a little piece of their story at the very least. So I wanted to try and, uh, and develop, you know, a kind of poem that would speak to their, in their voices and in their, to, to their condition and to their uh, to their consciousness uh, as as well as their physicality, and uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll show the uh, poem that I came up with. It's two very fascinating uh, uh, ladies who became kind of international superstars, traveling all around the world. But of course, they were born into slavery, so it begs the question: How did that happen? I don't know if I'll be able to do all of these poems here today, but I'm gonna try and do some of them. We'll get the gist. And this is the very first poem. I think, can y'all read that? Is that big enough to read? Yes, no? Okay, I'm seeing it. We, we, we only see the picture of the twins. Okay, I think I will uh, stop share and I'll try again. Let me see here. Uh, share screen and... Here we go. Can you see that now? Okay, great. So this is uh, what I call a syncopated sonnet. And it is uh, in, the, uh, in the voices of Millie and Christine McCoy together. 
And in this case, you have a sonnet, which is essentially a, these are Shakespearean sonnets, have a rhyme, rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. <laughs> uh, and they uh, are in two different voices. So if we read down the, the, uh, the left side, we have Millie's voice. We read down the right side, we have Christine's voice. We read in the middle, we find the voice of the two sisters speaking together. So we'll start in the middle. We would imagine Millie and Christine McCoy here with us speaking together. We're fused in blood and body from one thrum stem, blood budding twin blooms of song. We're double rows grown from hard labor that made our mother shout, spent with all. Him to pay soft homage, born of and beyond the flesh. We are just two women singing truths we can't forget. If we look at Millie's side of this equation, we've mended two songs, the one dark skin bleeding soprano into contralto, descended from raw carnage of the South, bursting open our freedom. We sing past rage to the work song's aria. It leaves us soaked in history like our father's sweat from plantation to grave. Lord, here we are. Free twin sisters who've hauled our voices far. If you look at Christine's part of this poem, ride the wake of each other's rhythm, beating our hearts syncopated tempo with a music all our own, with our mouths seeped in the glow of hand-me-down courage, drenched in spiritual acapellas, flowing soul from bone through skin. We pay debts from broken chattel to circus stars. We sing straight from this nation's barbed wire heart. And if you were to read or if we were to experience Millie and Christine being conjoined, going back voice for voice, line for line, it might sound something like, we've mended two songs, the one dark skin. We ride the wake of each other's rhythm, bleeding soprano into contralto, beating a heart syncopated tempo. We're fused in blood and body from one thrum stem, budding twin blooms of song. We're double rows, descended from raw carnage of the South with the music all our own, with our mouths bursting open our freedom. We sing past rage, seeped in the glow of hand-me-down courage, grown from hard labor that made our mother shout, spent with awe. We hymn to pay soft homage to the work song's aria. It leaves us drenched in spiritual acapellas, soaked in history like our father's sweat, flowing soul from bone through skin. We pay debts born of and beyond the flesh. We are just two women singing truths we can't forget from plantation to grave. Lord, here we are, from broken chattel to circus stars, free twin sisters who've hauled our voices far. We sing straight from this nation's barbed wired heart. Okay. How we doing on time? Anybody? Are we almost We're out good. of time? No, the night is yours. Okay, all right, well, I'm gonna try and do uh, uh, maybe a couple more, more of these, a few more, because they had a fascinating story. And the question behind this, their story is, well, how do they survive slavery? The other question for uh, uh, their owner, was what do you do with two Pygophagus twins born on your plantation, right? So they're born in 1849, North Carolina. What happens? Question for the master is, how am I going to make money off of these products born on my plantation? And uh, what he chose to do was not to put them in the, put them in the fields to, gather twice as many crops or in the house to clean or cook twice as much as other, other uh, people in bondage there. But what he did choose to do was to take them at a little bit over the uh, age of a year and rent them out to a traveling freak show. They went all around the various counties and all around the various cities and displayed Millie and Christine McCoy over and over and over and over and over and over and over again for a five cents here, a dime here, a quarter there, whatever. So this was at, done at the, at the age of really, you know, they, were, they were more or less just out of toddler phase. 
the pro the 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 problem also with that was the fact that every time they went to a new city, uh, there would be new doctors that would want to inspect them, you know, in the most personal fashion imaginable, over and over and over and over and over again. This happened because, of course, people wanted to verify that the contents of the freak show was legitimate, and also they wanted to you know satisfy their own scientific curiosity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so they had to endure that throughout, really, frankly, throughout most of their uh, their young childhood and adolescence until the end of the Civil War when they gained their liberation. That story is coming up. But uh, now, can you see this poem right here? The new one? Yes? Okay, great. Because this is the next poem in that series, which uh, is M Millie Christine on display, okay? So if we read down the middle, we find the twins conjoined voices. We count the blessings of our double shell as we pay our dues. We've proven ourselves for science. We've been taken town to town like prize bovine. We've been pawed up and down. Each sawbone has searched us from spine to loin. A wondrous oneness exists. We're conjoined. We're not frauds, but born of providence. God mended two souls into one dark skin. And at uh, at this at this point, where you, what she's you're, you're seeing is an inverted an inverted version of the previous syncopated sonnet. Same principles. Um, but there's you know, one wrinkle with these particular sonnets in that the reader has the, the capability of approaching them from different angles. So one might rediscover their story by reading as such. God mended two souls in the one dark skin. We're not frauds, but born of providence. And we've lists of doctors who understand. We've been probed, prodded, and roughly examined from my twin's navel to between her thighs, been photographed, half nude, verified to those who doubt our form. We have performed with each breath. We prove we've endured faith storm. We count the blessings of our double shell every time we rise to face the crowd's face on display. We've been richly, rudely paid to prove veracity. They've scanned each side and then back up, staring into my eyes from backbone to backbone, from hip to hip. Our miracle is real. Hear and see this. We're not frauds, but born of providence. God mended two souls in the one dark skin. We're not frauds, but born of providence. Our wondrous oneness exists. We're conjoined. Each sawbone has searched us from spine to loin like prize bovine. We've been pawed up and down for science. We've been taken town to town as we pay our dues. We've proven ourselves. We count the blessings of our double chill. Okay. So, you know, the, the reader has the, the capability of encountering the poem and the story in from, you know, multiple angles in order to, you know, discover the various truths of their, uh, of their experience. Um, uh, I, I would add that when, uh, when they became of age, they were able to get affidavits that proved the fact that they were conjoined twins and they no longer had, not, no longer had to be subjected to that kind of, uh, constant, constant, uh, inspection. Okay. Uh, but the, 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 the question continues, however, if you're, if you're the kind of guy who's going to take a couple of little girls and tour them all around the country from, side, from town to town, you might not have the highest level of morality. <laughs> and such was the case of the, of the guy that, that the, the owner had, had leased them to. And what he decided to do is he wanted to take, their, take the twins and keep all the money for himself. And how was he going to do that? Well, he decided to get on a boat, go to England, start to show all, up all over again, just rebuild the McCoy twins and just run it all over again. Don't have to send anything back to their, their master. Question for the master is, well, how, do, how does he get his property back? 
What he decided to do was take the mother, put him, put her on a boat with him, go over to England, track the twins down in the middle of a performance. And the, the twins, upon seeing their mother, ran to their mother saying, mommy. And that was part of his proof of ownership. Right. And he used, and he went to, through the court system and got the twins back into his possession. Now, the other part of this is uh, the fact that uh, at that time in England, I believe this is around 1851 or so, uh, slavery had been abolished. And the question for their mother was, would she stay in England to fight for her freedom and the freedom of her children, her two twins, or would she go back to the United States where she had a husband and about five other children? Such such are the uh, the peculiarities of the peculiar institution that those are the kinds of decisions she had to make. And this is a this is a poem about that decision. Right. We start at the bottom. We find her decision. Straight into Dixie's rebellious mouth. A mother left England and went back south, choosing between homeland and untold harms. We returned to a master we could trust. We went back to bondage in mother's arms. We earned a London court sympathy. And thus, though we'd missed family, were we not blessed? The thief's greed had set us free. Although bonded, we'd been smuggled to freedom soil, and yes, we'd been stolen from mother and master, absconded like contraband. We'd been shipped to Britain at the age of three, we'd been kidnapped afar, we'd been rented and sold, then snatched, taken straight from America's barbed wire heart like double dark treasures, entertainment at the age of three. We've been kidnapped afar, imported by a scallywag agent. We've been stolen from mother and master, absconded from slavery. We'd slipped into liberty. The thief's greed had set us free. Although bonded because of our great popularity, we'd under earned a London court sympathy. And thus, we sailed back to our Carolina home. We returned to a master we could trust. Torn between family or freedom's unknowns, our mother left England and went back south, straight into Dixie's rebellious mouth. So they ended up back in North Carolina. They continued to perform until the end of uh, the Civil War, at which point they were emancipated. And they faced the same questions that millions of Black folks were facing at the end of the Civil War. How do I make a living? How do I put food on my plate, roof over my head? And their decision uh, led them to uh, as I had explained before, they they also gained uh, affidavits from doctors that that explained the fact that they or verified the fact that they were indeed Pygopagus twins. So they took that documentation, went into went in, and went into the freak show business of their own volition. And I think it's important to remember that you talk, you know, these are two. They were other than multiple ways, you know. They were they were black, they were women, and they were differently able. And uh, for much of their life, a, a huge part of their community started to really be the freak shows that they were, that they traveled in. They, they had companionship and relationships with the, with the people that were in those shows. And so they, and they also realized the fact that, you know, they could make some money doing this, doing this profession. Right now, I should add that they did not just go out and be gawked at. You know, they didn't just stand in front of the audience and turn around and this and that, the other, and that was it. No, as a matter of fact, um, they played multiple instruments, spoke multiple languages, uh, actually wrote their own poetry, <laughs> uh, danced together, you know, they put on a hell of a show. Oops, I hope I could say that. <laughs> they put on a, a really great show and uh, they became famous, not just around the United States, but around the entire globe. Uh, they met with kings and queens and duchesses and, and princes, etc. They got paid in francs and ducats and marks, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, well, they, uh, they, uh, they, they 
were very wise with the with the way that they spent their money. They kept some of the money and they sent the rest of it back home to mom and dad in North Carolina. And what did mom and dad do with that money? They bought inch by inch, yard by yard, acre by acre. They bought the plantation upon which they had all just previously been slaves. And that land is still in the family's name to this day. So this next poem is, uh, is about that. It's called Millie Christine by Land. We're free twin sisters who've hauled our voices far. We melodize worldwide. More than just freaks, we're singing in drei Sprach und machen es Schwarz. That means roughly in German. We sing in three languages and make them all black. We sung hymns before Queen Victoria. We speak more than one tongue. Wherever we roam, we've made our wealth for gratification. We earn respect. We give solid proof that this gives pure gold. While we travel the road, we pay mortgage on our old plantation with dimes hoarded by pinching francs and pounds from each gawking crowd. Meanwhile, dollars stack against servitude. We sing freedom bound and we know the cost. We've overcome with the wets all mingled up to heaven. We bought land that once enslaved our parents. You can read it diagonally, you know, whichever way you want. <laughs> and uh, one, one last poem for the McCoy twins tonight. Well, one penultimate poem, and that would be, you know, a poem just about the way they regarded themselves. They were, they uh, clearly had a, a, a tremendous amount of courage, uh, clearly um, uh, were highly motivated when they came back, when they eventually retired, they went back to their, uh, you know, to their, to the little town and lived out, you know, the rest of their days. They lived to be in their mid sixties. Uh, I'm not, I, I'm trying to remember. I think first Millie passed away and then I think Christine passed within a day after her. Uh, but they were the longest living example of Pygopagus twins, I, I believe ever. Uh, and they also, they, they also gave a lot of money to the, to the churches in their communities and to the, to their families. They were, you know, fascinating, very generous, uh, courageous women. And this is their last, you know, well, this is a poem for them. And trying try to imagine the way they felt about themselves. So here, this is the story I want you to hear. One body crooning two notes. By God, we're our own duet. Listen to how we're bound in unison. Listen to the grace we have ringing within me and my other half, airborne shook and shimmering through my head like sympathetic strings. Each sung sound with Christine's voice at my side. I have sung in a way very few could comprehend so you can see my life is brimmed. It's full with every breath we've got. I'm filled completely with souls ablaze. This is how I know love, the way any other human would love. I love my song and dance and family the way you love your own blood, twice as much. I've doubled the cause to celebrate life. I love this burden that we've been given to ride the shed wake of one blood's rhythm. I love this burden that we've been given. I love my song and dance and family the way any other human would love, with souls ablaze. This is how I know love, but every breath we've got, I'm filled completely. So you can see my life is brimmed. It's full with Billy's embracing contrapuntal, ringing within me and my other half, airborne shook and shimmering through my head like sympathetic strings. Each song sound one body quitting two notes. By God, we're our own duet. Listen to how we're bound in unison. Listen to the grace we have here. This is our story I want you to hear. So that's the penultimate poem, but the, uh, there's one last one, bear with me just a little bit longer. And, and there's this uh, one last poem that really is a conglomeration of the previous poems. Uh, in uh, Poetry Land, uh, there's, a, there's a poem called A Crown of Sonnets uh, in which the last line of one line becomes the first line of the next poem and, and so on and so forth until the last line of the last line. Last line of the last poem is the first line of the first poem. I wasn't able to do that in this case, but however, what I was able to do was to take this very first poem, 
and take the end lines and the beginning lines. We made it two songs in one dark skin, ride the wake of each other's rhythm. We sing straight from this nation's barbed wire heart, free twin sisters of all our voices far and duplicate them in the other poems. So for instance, and uh, here you have uh, God made two souls in one dark skin. Here you have uh, straight from America's barbed wire heart. And here you have, uh, we're free twin sisters who heart our voices far. And here you have to ride the shed wake of one blood's rhythm. So when you align these, li these individual lines up in the various poems, what you end up with is something that looks like this. Okay. And that is a star of syncopated sonnets, which the reader can read from the top all the way through the middle, down to the bottom, all the way up through the middle, and then down to the bottom, and perhaps all the way up to the top. Again, in whichever direction the, want, the reader wants to go. And uh, this is what you would call a, a concrete poem as well. And then a concrete poem is just a poem that takes on the shape of the subject of the poem. So in this case, you have two separate heads, a conjoined body and two separate bases, right? Just as the McCoy twins. So stars of the show, McCoy twins, syncopated sonnets. Thank you. I think that's, that's enough of me talking for a minute. No, thanks, Taima. Um, so now we're going to um, start a conversation with Taima and uh, Tara Betts. Um, and then after this, we'll open it up to answering questions. So you can use the Q&A feature or you can just type a question into the chat, whatever you feel works best. Hey, Tara. Great. So I'll keep an eye on the chat box. I'm, I'm sure I have a ton of questions I could ask. Um, I'm not sure what the book group may be interested in asking, but. Sorry, I, Tara, I just wanted to clarify for you. You can go right on ahead and uh, we'll take care of the the chat box after. Yeah. 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 So do I've been teaching you enough on Zoom that I will be peeking though, because it's just out of habit now. So, uh, <laughs> but other than that, I think. I, I was kind of leading into, we almost had a discussion about this book when it first came out and, or when, or rather when you first won the prize because there was a Chicago public library where Tayamba and I were supposed to talk about the book and it was a bunch of little kids that came to the reading. Oh yeah, I remember that, yeah. yeah. You know, we were both kind of looking like, I don't know. That was <laughs> well, they really got into it. Yeah, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, like I, I was really concerned at first because it's a lot of material, but once they started to see the photographs and hear the stories, they got really into it. So I kind of was curious, looking back on it, what did you think about that moment? Because in the moment, it was kind of like, okay, what is going to happen here? Yeah, you know, kids are kids are the toughest audience. That's just the way. It is. <laughs> yeah, chill, none. So uh, it was it was good to be able to connect with some kids at, at that moment. Yeah. That was, yeah. That was good. I remember I was sitting with my copy, and there was a little girl sitting next to me, and she's like, "What page are we on?" So we're sitting there looking at it together, and I I just kind of thought about as a lead into my next question if you could talk a little bit about the research that went into the book. Cause I feel a lot of people are interested in doing thematic books now, but I don't think they understand necessarily what a deep investment in the subject matter sometimes really means. And I think in terms of the time and your process, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about that. Well, um, <laughs> the, I, there was a lot of research that went into the book, the bibliography in the back of the book that lists the various books that uh, 
were referenced in the various articles, et cetera, that were referenced in, in getting the information for the book. Uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it was, it's, it was, it's kind of like just totally geeking out on history and following sources and trying to get primary sources as much as one can and, and looking up obscure references and, and in a, in a certain way, trying to find out every, everything that you, that you can about a, a historical subject and, and also an era mm -hmm. that, that, that you can, uh, and then facing a blank page <laughs> and saying, right. okay, how do I, what part of this story, how do I approach this story and, and how, and, and what am I, what do I think, what speaks to me in this story? What speaks to what I think uh, that person would be experiencing at different moments in this, in their lives? And, mm -hmm. and what is the lesson I'm learning from right. reading that, reading about their, their struggles and their, and their triumphs? And how do I bring that to this, this forum? You know, how does that, how does this, this understanding change me, right? And how do I bring that understanding to the, to the poem? Yeah. I feel like that's a really key question. Like what, what's the, what do you get out of all of those stories and all that information and how can you translate it into something that means something for a reader? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's critical. I think, you know, um, and plowing, you know, you know, plowing is probably the wrong word, but, but, you know, trying to, uh, to, discern and to a certain degree dissect all the information that, mm -hmm. that one comes privy to uh, and, and dealing with conflicting sources and conflicting stories and mm -hmm. trying to figure out, you know, you know what happens. And, 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 and then understanding that, uh, you know, you've got the story as best as you can get it for this particular moment. <laughs> you know? Right. So... Yeah. I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to pull some of the audience questions because they have some really good ones. Right. Um, I know one of the questions I've been wanting to ask, because I remember when you were working on Lead Belly, I remember this book when I first read it. And one of the things that I think is so compelling is not just the artists that are at the beginning, but that overarching narrative of Scott Joplin. Like, to me, that's what I was into as a reader. And in particular, when you get to about page 150, I think that's in that range, that's when Lottie Joplin starts talking. And I haven't heard anybody talk about that section of the book. Uh, which to me, is really interesting because to look at that and Lead Belly, you see how the women have a certain kind of agency that they don't have in the first book, Right. Not that they're not there, uh -huh. but they talk different. Yeah. And I really appreciated that too. So I kind of was curious, how did you kind of yeah. get them in your ear? That was a, you know, that's a really good question. Um, you know, first off, like, first off, Scott is the hardest one to approach because he's the best known. Yeah. Everybody knows Scott. I mean, not everybody, but generally people know who Scott Joplin was and they immediately kind of have an image in his, in their mind. Or they um, think of doctoral's who, ragtime or something. Say what? Or they think of doctoral's ragtime or something like that. Right, right, right. So he was, to, in my mind, he's the hardest one to approach through a poem. And, and, but he also, you know, the sections that are about Scott Joplin allowed a kind of narrative arc to happen in the in the in the book that that grounded me, I think, in a kind of uh, in a in a kind of story that told us told a side of Scott that we really don't think about. Like he had a he had a he had a hard life. Yeah. He did. However, he's the almost the only one 
that you would be able to really identify out of all the people in the book. I mean, I was, mm-hmm. yeah, I didn't know about a lot of these people. So, um, and the women in, in, in that, that are in the book, well, Lottie Joplin was his wife. And, you know, they, they definitely had, they had an interesting history together. Uh, after she, after he died, her uh, roaming house was still a gathering place for musicians, you know, um, and and she, you know, she was close to him in a very, uh, very different kind of way. You know, she saw him, she saw him die. She saw him lose his faculties due to syphilis. Mm. She saw him try to mount a successful version of a really what was an, an incredible piece of work, Tremonitia, mm. you know, which was a kind of ragtime or ragtime centric kind of or waltz centric kind of kind of play. Uh, that was way ahead of his time for, uh, but he was not able to get the back and do it. But, you know, they seem to be down for each other in a very special kind of way. And, uh, and um, she also was, she was also in conversation with this, this, this imaginary that I made up there was going around the country interviewing people that knew Scott and she and, and they they argue with each other and this is what this is actually a I got from Tiari Jones uh I I talked to Tiari about those pieces and one one thing she was said that really helped me flesh out you know or my understanding of the of the characters was to have them disagree on something and to have the and and they did have they did have a kind of argument and she she kind of um in listening to her her argument and to and in listening to her the way she presents herself she really you know um really helped me figure out some of the motivations and how to explain some of the motivations between behind Scott and herself, et cetera. So, sure. I, you know, it was a real challenge, you know, and the other, there's, you know, uh, Edmonia Lewis uh, uh, had a real interesting kind of, I tried to approach Edmonia through her sculptures. Mm. Sissy Reddit Jones, you know, was kind of like getting into this, this turbulent operatic, uh, vibe that she that I wanted to explore with her she kind of she had really took agency over her over her uh her circumstances and and was still a diva so to speak I mean she was an opera singer yeah and you know she was she as you if you see pictures of her 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 dresses are just covered with medals that she won from uh, recognition from kings here and princes there, and and in in certain cases, you know, uh, in the Caribbean, they re- they really loved her, and they just gave they gave her a lot of medals. And she, you know, she was, you know, very uh, um, uh, a woman of of great bearing and sophistication. You know, and she brought that to the stage. At the same time, however, she was singing in a, in a minstrel show. You know, because that's the only way that she was going to be able to present her work on a regular basis. So, you know, that, just a lot of fascinating characters, and uh, uh, yeah, I think too, poetry lets you look at the history and dissect the details a little bit more differently, right? Like. Even hearing you talk about the medals mm. says so much about what Black artists had to do to go overseas to find success. Yeah. You know, I mean, she's basically wearing that. And that that's the kind of thing that you can write about in a poem 
and it says everything that the history books books do not or that the articles that maybe just have a picture do not so i'm going to lead into something a little bit different because we have tons of questions um i know ryan was curious he mentioned a range of poets he says there seems to be a lot of black poets recently in the u.s who are utilizing persona to engage with historical subjects and the process of history making. So he names Natasha Treadway, Frank X. Walker, Elizabeth Alexander, Marilyn Nelson, who I know you were reading when you first started working on Lead Belly a lot, Patricia Smith, Adrian Tika, so, so on and so forth. And he says, what do you see as inspiring and or instigating this recent trend, if not a movement? That's interesting. I never really considered a, a movement, so to speak, but I would say that, you know, well, the person that I really learned a lot about uh, persona poetry from was really Patricia Smith. Because, mm. uh, you know, I got to, you know, you and I both saw her at the Green Mill back mm. in the day, and, you know, hitting the stage and and when she would inhabit these these characters, they would just be, they would just be there directly, you know, on on stage. One thing I learned from you know Patricia was that she worked really hard on the page in order to bring it to the stage. Uh, but what, but another but what, and the other thing I kind of start started to observe was that in persona, you're speaking in the first person. And there's something about that that it's a it's a it's a very subtle psychological trick, but as you are reading the the text, you are in the perspective of the person. You're that much closer to really actually being there. So it, it really helped. It really just kind of cranks up the tension in a in a different kind of way. You know. So. Uh, uh, I think the other thing I would say about persona is, you know, is reconciling with the fact that, yes, you are trying to write in this person's voice, so to speak, but, you know, to reconcile with the fact that you, you are writing to a certain degree about yourself. Yeah. And, and, and to live with that and, and, to, and understand it as an amalgam of, of your interpretation versus this, per, your understanding of someone else's circumstances. And now help, you know, for me that, that helped me deal with a lot of the, and sometimes it's really subconscious, you know? But uh, yeah, that's, that's my brand of therapy, I guess. Yeah, well, we're all kind of writing through the lens of how we see the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna combine we got kind of a similar question from Laura Yu and EJ Antonio, where they yeah. wanted you to talk about, I know, right? It was like, hi, EJ. Um, we wanted to uh, ask about the materiality of the books and the creative control in the production of the book and the format of the book and the pages that get torn out. And what was that like to kind of undertake those kinds of choices in the publishing process? You know what, that's, a lot of that straight up is, is straight up luck. I'm gonna say 100%. I'm a very lucky person. Now, my first book, Lead Belly, was chosen through, through the National Poetry Series by Bridget Piquin Kelly. If you haven't looked at her work, please do. It's, you know, stunning, stunningly, you know, yeah. visual. The song is phenomenal. Right. Uh, and she was attached to a, a very young press called Verse Slash, I think it was just Verse at the time, and it became Verse Slash Wave. That was in 2005, 2004, right? Okay. Um, and so they, they, I didn't know who they, these, these, <laughs> these folks were, uh, but, uh, you know, eventually, uh, you know, they did the first book and they did a fantastic uh, job with it. You know, Matt, Matt Zapruder, Joshua Beckman, 
Um, uh, they did a they did a fantastic job with it. Uh, and time passed. A lot of time passed. Uh, I think it was like seven years before I presented them with the, the next project, and that was Olio. But, but they are they're bibliophiles. They love you know they love the art they love love the technology of the book, and I don't think there's any other press that would have done what. Uh, what they did with Olio, talking about here, you know, here we go. Okay, right. And and the thing that's cool with Wave is their books tend to have a very similar style. Like you can tell a book that comes from Wave. Right. Well, that's the reason. But this one does so much different stuff that the other books in their press doesn't do. Right. The reason this 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 came about was because I started to realize, oh, they don't do cover art. That's the bottom line. They just don't do cover art, but can play with the the placement of the letters and that's how that happened you know this yeah. is the mother of so to speak you know but here's here's some of the pages that have been torn out of the book you know i, I would i would tear one out right now but i mean you can see that they're very smooth on the edge perforated you know I am, but yo. do you do, do you ever have it like i didn't want to tear out any of the pages from my book what i didn't do it either and, and almost everyone <laughs> Almost everyone said that. <laughs> I'm gonna show you right now. Okay, here's the McCoy twins. Uh huh. All right here you go. Now, I mean, I'm just I haven't creased on this or anything like that. I'll show you right now. Here we go. This is something you don't see in your average uh, book reading. Here you go. Uh -huh. Here the page. Oh. See that? And I cringe. I cringe. Okay. <laughs> right? And you can have them on display, so to speak, you know, in your place. Like this, except I would say in this case, you're engaging in the story of the twins instead of just the, the physicality. Yeah, yeah. I also want to just uh, take a moment to sort of shift the focus because prior to this, we spent the, the past three weeks reading, reading your book, reading Oleo. And um, it was probably the second book of poetry. Last year, we read um, The Crazy Bunch by Willie Perdomo. Um, so this is the second book of poetry that we've sort of taken on. And I'm, I'm just wondering, as we sort of, I, I want book club members to try to chime, anybody who participated in the book club, um, we want them to chime in. But I was just wondering, has have many book clubs taken on the book that you know of? Uh, you know what? Not a, not a lot. Not that it hasn't happened that that much. So mm -hmm. you know, I think really, frankly, this this is the first one 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 book one blank that I've been a part of. Although I, I do I am have been a part of some university. Situations mm -hmm. where people mm -hmm. subscribe or or assign the book to multiple classes. Yeah, yeah. So we we do want to encourage any of the book club members. Paula, Paula facilitated the book club for the past three weeks. Yes, I did. Yeah. Hello, Tyra. Yeah, I just want to hey. take a moment and say hi. Uh, thank you so much, Tyra. There's a uh, great questions, great facilitation. And my book club members know I like external praise. So I'm just going to clap you up for that. Because it's not easy being in conversation around things that we may have already not visited, right? Look at us clapping. Um, Simon, I hope you're having fun with us. I am. Yeah, great. Um, we do this every, every Tuesday if you're ever free. Right. But okay. as my book club members who I know, I trust in them that they're not going to leave me up here dolo solo to also participate in conversation with you. Um, Something that I'm watching as I'm seeing you talk about the pages and the manipulation of the pages is something that has come up for us, particularly at One Book, One Bronx. We're a black and brown space. You don't have to, you don't have to be black and brown to be in the space, but we are in the Bronx, right? And part of our journey and community of coming together every week is to sort of piece apart 
and pick apart these stories that tell the liberation or not of black people. And being in black body, I wonder often with this book, watching you tear out the pages, are you giving us the onus or the responsibility as the reader to also like, you know, you, men you mentioned so eloquently how we don't know a lot of these people, a lot of these people are unknown and the book sort of feels like that welcoming tool to bring you in into something else you'd wanna know. And as someone like me who, again, naming that, we're constantly looking for stories in our space that help us tell stories to a greater liberation for black people. How, do those things connect for you? You're like, yeah, I already thought of that. Is that something, you know, cause it kept coming up for us as a group. It felt like a workbook. That was a term that people kept using. It felt like something that I could take with me to my next part of whatever. A work so how do you feel about that? Uh, wow. Uh, I was not going for the workbook vibe, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know what? I think that, I think that, um, I think that it's, 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 it was a task, you know, that I was trying to engage in to make these obscured stories more accessible, you know? Okay. So rather than an onus, it's an accessibility. It's a, you can come and be a part of this. Yeah. You know, and you know what, while you're at it, have some, have some fun. I mean, yeah. I know that that term isn't one might, one that one might associate with ant, antebellum and just postbellum slate, uh, 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 poetry or, you know, but it is there's an invitation to, to the reader to engage in a kind of play. I love that. But in that in the in the course of engaging in that play, what the reader is actually doing is further investigating the, the predicaments and the life choices involved in these in these in these very real lives. And at and then at the same time, they're also investigating life choices that they have to make because we're talking about 1917 1921 you know that's what one grandma ago right you know right and that that understanding of time also came up for us often in book club because i, I think you had said it earlier prior in your readings naming how um whether a forced circumstance or acquired circumstance you know, and I'm going to use God real quick. They were given a divinity. They were given a sense of gift and affirmation by God. When you, when you're in your art and all of us up here are like writers or artists and our entire community is made up as well. When you're in your art and you're in those motions through hell or high water, if you can make it work, you can make it work. And I think what we were really moved by book club members, don't leave me. I'm going to embarrass y'all. Don't leave me up here alone. We were moved by that notion that in black body and black existence in this time, there's still that like divine affirmation that these are the things that you're meant to do in the world um you know regardless of the circumstance and that was you know the group came up with that but that was like an amazing connection for us to have you know what thank you I, I i would add that i think there's an there's an, uh, an observation i'm trying to make or trying to uh engage in and that is is that is the idea of taking the received form in manipulating the received form in order to create what you actually need. Mm. In, in other words, uh, in this case, it's taking a sonnet and doubling down on it in certain ways in order to create a dialectic that is uh, in conversation with um, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois' uh, idea of a double consciousness. It's also reminiscent in certain uh, certain contexts of the idea of double talk, <laughs> right? Uh, and and it's um it's also you know an example of of, of taking the received form and, and flipping it. So, for instance, that that's what's happened. That's what happened with multiple instruments. You say the you know the the harmonica. The guitar, the saxophone, you know, the piano, all of these received instruments being 
being encountered in ways that had not really been imagined before by the people that produced that instrument, right? But that's what we do. Right. You know, we take a we take a turntable. It was not meant to be a musical instrument at all. Right. And make a musical instrument out of it, you know? Right. You know, go on and on and on with examples like that. But no, and I think that that notion relates to what I was saying about the workbook. I know you received it as like, oh, that's boring, but we love workbooks at book club. Oh, we, right. we are those type, we are those kind of people. But just you no, know, the idea that we get to tangibly play around with what we think we're being told and maybe even sometimes be invited into something else. So that, that notion actually resonates really true for us. Something that um, one of our book club members just said that I want to mention right now is that the book challenges us to make a way out of no way. Shout out to EJ. And I think, you know, that really encompasses what you're trying to say. I want to take the moment to, I guess, I guess I got to do it like this because no one's piped up. Some more anyone in book club love to take a minute or two? We have about three to five minutes of questions, right, Ron? Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, I do have a question from someone and they're asking, they're saying that the work is fascinating, great, informative, can you provide recommendations as to how to go about constructing a contrapuntal poem? Because I, I know you just named right now that tension. You, I think there, there must, I'm assuming there must be an obvious need for that sort of double talk tension, something there or not. But this person wants to know, how do you go about making one? Well, you know what? I would step back from how, how to make one and ask, why am I making one? Mm. In other words, um, the the idea of using this form in this particular book is 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 very particular for the reasons in this book. For one, sonnets were very popular in the 19th century, and in, from in my mind, it is a way of being in communication with the inhabitants of the book. You know what I'm saying? I mean that's that's. Very, very common to, to, to have an understanding of poetry through a device like a sonnet. Right. So that's one thing. Then you're talking about double consciousness and the other issues that I, I talked about before. But the real issue to me is, does form follow function? Hmm. Is the form that you're choosing serving, adding to in a substantial way the issues of the poem. Because if it, if it isn't, then it's going to be a gimmick. Right. See, that's what I was sweating throughout this whole scenario was, yo, am I, am I right. doing this? What are, what, what are legitimate reasons for doing this? Otherwise, it's going to kind of cheapen the message. Right. And so uh, that is the primary thing. So, you, so then you're th to me, I'm thinking about, well, who are the... Who are the voices in the poem? What does this contrapunt, contrapunt, contrapuntality <laughs> have to contribute to the uh, my understanding of the subject matter? Um, you know, is it worth it? Because I I wore down a couple of bottles of liquor by <laughs> <laughs> right, some of these joints. Right. So worth it? Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that is the really critical issue is, is cause, and maybe, you know, maybe you want to do something totally, totally different. Maybe you want to like, because that's what, that's what poets do. They come in and they see the received form and then they like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to jerk it like this. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to roll it like that and, and improvise on it like so-and-so and such and such. And I think that, that is a way to think about it. It's just like, like the, the dynamic of the dialectic between two voices, not just, not just thinking about, well, how exactly do I reproduce this thing that I just saw in this book? So that, that's what I would say. That makes sense. Like, what is the actual service to whatever it is the thing you're trying to make? Right. right. I hope that answered your question, person. Okay. Other question we have from a book club participant. Uh, the Freed songs seem to, right. seem to appropriate Berryman's language in a way, like in a poem like Mark Twain versus Blind Tom or Eliza Bethune versus Charity Wiggins. Can you just touch a little bit more about the that manipulation of language a little bit? 
or appropriation is the word that the that the reader asks. Absolutely. You know what? What I'll do is I'll uh, I'll share one of them. Why don't I do that? And um, we love that. Here we go. Uh, let me see if I can find the actual poem here. Here's one. Uh, well, here's. Here's one that's also also contrapuntal, and this this is taken from the actual you know introduction to uh, Berryman's The Dream Songs. Now the Berryman's John Berryman's Dream Songs won the Pulitzer Prize in the year I was born, uh, nineteen five, uh, and uh, he in it he's he's stepping into the into the voice of a minstrel character in order to help himself investigate his own psyche mm -hmm. you no know, as a as a middle-aged white professor you know who's a poet in the world and this on uh, on the italicized part of this poem is directly from the introduction mm the book right and now on the other side is the are the words of a guy named uh henry box brown mm -hmm. i should add also that the that the 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 kind of personification of this minstrelized voice was uh henry mm -hmm. right? and with with henry box brown here's a cat many people know the story of henry box brown he was a slave in virginia then Really, the, the the other story is is that his his master sold his entire family downriver, like a wife and I believe it was three kids, just sold the whole, all of them like that. Uh, and so after that, he was like, "Okay, I'm out," and he put himself in a in a crate, got himself mailed to Philadelphia, came out the crate singing. Then he produced a a kind of uh, um, a uh, a slave narrative that, came, that was very popular. It was actually a little bit too popular for, for some, of, some of the people, his contemporaries' uh, blood. And, it, and then they literally tried to kidnap him and dry, drag him back into slavery. So he said, okay, he beat these people off. And then like the very next day or next week, bam, he was on a, on a boat to, print, to Britain where he, where he set up a whole performance of not only the history of of the slave trade in America but that slave trade in America culminating in his own escape from a, in, from a crate he went on to do this for years etc at any rate I kind of wanted to be in conversation with John Berryman Henry Box Brown having the name Henry coming out of a box, right? Uh, out of imprisonment. I wanted to investigate Berryman and see uh, ways in which this, we could, in, you know, interrogate his use of the minstrelsy. So here we go. Huh. Berryman, the poem then, whatever its wide cast of characters is essentially about an imaginary character, not the poet, not me, named Henry, a white American at in early middle age, sometimes in blackface, who has suffered an irreversible loss and talks about himself. And Henry Box Brown is, let me say, despite loss, I won my life. This story, how a slave steals back his skin, smuggles loose like I did. It lives on, but the words and free. I'm Box Brown. Ain't masking my truth. One day I delivered myself. I ate my love for those left behind. Berryman can't talk for them. Can't tell my tale at all. We put them together. The poem then, let me say, whatever its wide cast of characters, despite loss, I won my life. This story is essentially about how a slave steals back his skin. An imaginary character smuggles loose like I did. It lives on. Not the poet, but the words, and not me, free. I'm named Henry Box Brown. Ain't a white American masking my truth. One day, in early middle age, 
I delivered myself. Sometimes I ache in my black face love for who has suffered those left behind. An irreversible loss. Berryman can't talk for them and talks about himself. Can't tell my tale at all. So, uh, yeah, what I'm trying to do is match the beat of uh, his poems. So these are syllabically symmetrical. There's many syllables per line. Um, one side is the R on the other. Um, and to give a kind of ability for, for, for Henry Box Brown to speak back onto uh, the legacy of, uh, of uh, John Berryman. On that note, um, thank you so much, Paula Ramirez, for facilitating the conversation, the end, Tara Betts also facilitating with Tayemba Jess, and of course, uh, the man, Tayemba Jess, for blessing us this evening. I have known Tayemba for over 20 years. Yeah. We were both young, fresh faces. Now we're, <laughs> now we're aging, fresh faces. Yeah, it's, fresh. It's, and I've known Tara even longer. Better than <laughs> though. So, it, but it's been an honor just to do this program with both of you, you know, after, you know, I think I met both of you in Chicago at the Gwendolyn Brooks Writers Conference, and just to see all of us sort of still here, still making a way. Um, I, I appreciate all of your efforts and your energy and the intellect that you bring um, to everything that you do. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Uh, thanks to uh, Lehman College and and uh, all the participants. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Tara, and thank you, Paula. You know, it's been it's been great. And thanks to all the members of the book club for uh, right. coming through. Mm -hmm.